So our, our program today is part of day one of three for our Inclusive Excellence Week. Um, and to begin, we wanted to share a brief acknowledgement um, alongside our community members at the at and Center for Indigenous Politics and Policy that GW resides on the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Piscataway and Anacostan peoples who have served as stewards of the region for generations. Even though we gather virtually today, um, we do recognize that we all gather as part of the GW community. Um, and with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Wall to get us started in the session. Great, thank you, Kylie. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Um, this is a really great chance for us to highlight some fantastic teaching that's going on in Elliott and, and provide that as a platform so that we can all learn um, some new techniques and different techniques on approaching our um, courses, our syllabus, our construction of uh, pedagogy um, in, in, in a more improved manner in the coming uh, years. So with that, what I wanted to do is today we have two speakers um, and I'll introduce them both first, our, our faculty. And then we also have three student panelists who I will have as discussants and I'll introduce afterwards. So I'll start with um, introducing Professor Ingrid Krapel. Uh, she is an associate professor of political science and international affairs. She received her PhD in political science from the University of Chicago. She is the author of Toleration and Identity Foundations in Early Thought and co-editor of Toleration on Trial. Her expertise includes identity, theories of enmity and conflict, origins of toleration and liberalism, early modern and political thought. And she teaches 20th century political thought and courses on identity theory and politics. Her courses also include what I think is notable, topics of equality and justice, such as the Holocaust, literature by Ta-Nehisi Coates, and feminist Simone de Beauvoir, as well as many others. And then uh, I'd also like to introduce Nathan Brown. Nathan Brown is a professor of political science and international affairs. He received his PhD in politics and Near Eastern studies from Princeton University. He is the author of Arguing Islam After the Revival of Arab Politics and When Victory is Not an Option, Islamist Movements in Arab Politics. His expertise covers the comparative politics of the Middle East, democratization and authoritarianism, Islam and politics, constitutionalism and rule of law in the Arab world. He teaches the Middle East in international affairs as well as courses on comparative politics he has a wonderful course that includes many writers from the Middle East and speakers from Tunisia, Saudi Arabia, and elsewhere. So basically both of these faculty capture the essence of inclusive teaching by bringing in diverse ideas and voices from different groups and regions. So what now I would like to have them share with you how they thought through building a diverse course. And with that, I would like to start with uh, Ingrid, uh, Professor Ingrid Krapel. Great, uh, thank you so much for inviting me to this wonderful uh, conference and to give me the opportunity to talk about how I build strategies for inclusive teaching into my work. Um, I will uh, share a few slides in a moment, but I, I do wanna just say some general things. First, um, I teach courses that cross list for political science, the university honors program and the Elliott School. And I teach specifically political theory and the history of political thought. So in a way, um, I, it's easy for me um, to be able to bring in diverse perspectives because political theory is itself um, a, a type of enterprise that ought to be inclusive and open because it asks the fundamental questions about the nature of political life, the nature of power, where it comes from, what is justice? How did ideas of freedom and equality develop and evolve um, and are forged in human history? So it is something that inherently already brings in comparison and, um, and contrast. So I wanted to just organize my thoughts in terms of first, why should we do this? 
and then how to do this how should how should we go about trying to expand our syllabi to include more uh, diverse voices and perspectives in what we bring to the students first of all why do it for me teaching and learning is uh, it's not just uh, conveying knowledge or information that's absolutely essential to the endeavor, but it's also to cultivate students who can think broadly and be moral political citizens in their countries and in the world. So I, I see the enterprise of education as not simply conveying being a conveyor belt of knowledge, but also helping students learn how to think how to criticize, how to judge, how to make arguments, and to be moral and political citizens. So for me, that must include coming to terms with the world in which we live. And our world is quite diverse and we have many challenges. So it's necessary therefore that we include a broad range of thinkers. Um, how to go about doing that? I thought I would share some of my syllabi just so, um, you get a, a sense of how I, I go about constructing the syllabi. Now, the canon of the history of political thought um, is it's a very uh, conventional canon in some way. You have the ancient world, the medieval world uh, with classic thinkers, the early modern period and the modern period, and then 20th century political thought. So there are, it's, it's viewed as a long conversation through history. And so there are classic thinkers. You begin with Plato and Aristotle, the pre-Socratics, you go to St. Augustine, Aquinas, Machiavelli, uh, et cetera, et cetera, all the way through to the 20th century. So in that classic kind of conceptualization of the history of political thought, it seems to me that I didn't want to just teach it as if these were thinkers who were kind of like museum pieces, you know, all along the way that you're kind of going to a museum and learning about some potted plant history of these thinkers, but that they bring up timeless themes. And how do they do that? So I'm going to pull up some, um, the one of the syllabi that, um, that Raleigh really in, liked uh, that I had uh, sent to her. So I, I think that that might help you see the way I organize the themes. Um, and I will share my screen here. Um, yeah. Okay, so in this, in this syllabus, I begin, I try to weave together thinkers, the historical period in which they're writing and themes. It, and, and so the complexity of the syllabus is that, you know, you begin with the historical location of the thinkers, but then you weave together different themes in it. So in this case, I, I begin with the modern state in the early, mo in the modern period in the 20th century. And I then um, move to the themes of freedom and responsibility and look at Hannah Arendt's work on Eichmann in Jerusalem. Um, and then pair that with both Isaiah Berlin's conception of history and then Michel Foucault's work. I then move on to equality and justice and I jump all the way back to the beginning of the 20th century with W.E.B. Du Bois, um, The Souls of Black Folk. And then in this particular iteration of this class, I use ta Coates's work instead of um, just continuing with Du Bois or choosing another thinker. I then kind of pair that with Simone de Beauvoir and then a classic thinker of the 20th century, uh, John Rawls's uh, theory of justice. And then I move to kind of this larger palette of issues that we are confronted with. And I, I enjoyed teaching uh, Pope Francis's encyclical, which is about climate change actually. So that is one way in which I try to um, include uh, diverse thinkers by understanding the historical period, uh, the, the timeless themes and how we continue as um, moral and political students who need to understand the, the context in which we make judgments and process knowledge, who are the thinkers who would be most evocative and challenging for our, our students today. So that is one way in which I try to build a syllabus that includes themes, thinkers, and um, issues that um, 
that are diverse and inclusive. And I can say a lot more about how I go about doing it, but I think I'll stop there for now and um, maybe, I guess, allow uh, Nathan to say something about he about how he does that. Please, Nathan. Um, um, thank you very much. Um, like Ingrid, I sort of approach this question saying, wait, why do I have to worry about this, right? This is what I already do, right? I'm teaching about the Middle East um, in an American college classroom. There's sort of a diverse voices built into this. Um, but I've actually thought more about my teaching over the last year, as much because of COVID as anything else. Um, and I approach the question very, very differently. Um, I've been teaching at GW since 1987. So if I'm, 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 if I'm a model of new teaching, it's a big shock to me. But I was talking um, recently with the dean in the Get Acquainted session, and I told her kind of what I was doing in terms of, 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 of the class. And, and the lesson is you should be careful what you say to the dean, because then she tells somebody else and you get put on a panel and, and you're, you're, you're held up for what you're doing. So what, am, what is it that I'm doing? Well, when I first started teaching at GW back in 1987, I went and entered a classroom, and this was comparative politics of the Middle East, a course I still teach. Um, and sitting in the classroom was the daughter-in-law of a former head of state of a Middle Eastern country and the son of the founder of the largest opposition party in that same country. And I walk in and I'm thinking, it's like, um, okay, it, this is a problem. And why is it a problem? Because they're going to want to speak up and they're going to just give their particular point of view. And my job is to deliver to them, you know, essentially a disciplinary knowledge, political science. Um, and, and there's something to be said for that kind of attitude, right? I'm supposed to be teaching a political science course, so I'm going to teach them how political scientists approach these questions, not their stories from growing up in this sort of thing. That was kind of the, 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 the attitude, and, 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 it, and it does make some sense. Um, but what I thought over the last year for a variety of reasons is that gets things slightly wrong, right? It means people in the Middle East speak only mediated through me. And I'm happy to do that mediation, but 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 there are voices that and and diverse voices um, that that can be heard uh, directly. That there are that one of the things I'm trying to communicate in 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 this class is that the Middle East is not some external exotic region which we you know study like we're studying you know the moon or or or, or pluto or something um but it's 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 diverse it has diverse perspectives within it and and it's not necessarily all that alien there are all kinds of connections we can make with our own society all kinds of connections that students bring to the classroom of of experiences with the region family heritage and so forth and so on and those were things to draw on um so i try to I try to teach it differently. Um, the course that I'm teaching this semester is the uh, it's a Middle East survey course. So what I tell students is this should be either their first course or their last course on the Middle East, maybe both, right? So if you want to just take one course on the Middle East, this is supposed to be the one within the LA School of International Affairs. But if you're say a Middle East major or have a major interest in the Middle East, this would be a good gateway course. Um, and, um, um, and what I said the task of doing, my task of doing is essentially introducing diverse voices. Um, and that's hard. It's hard for me. Um, and I think it can be confusing for the students because they're hearing, you know, they're saying, wait a second, we're hearing this this week, we're hearing this th that week. Um, what's, what's the core that we're supposed to take away? Um, um, but it's fun. And, and so I wouldn't hold myself necessarily up as a model because I'm learning as I go along as to how to work this. I'm aided by a few things. Um, Number one, I made it, um, 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 uh, Kylie said at the beginning, you know, unfortunately we have to meet virtually by Zoom. No, I'm aided by this, right? I can basically call somebody in the Middle East and say, we're doing something on, you know, I had something earlier in, the, in, in this semester. We wanted to have somebody who'd experienced the position of being stateless in Kuwait. And they say, okay, we're going to have you for 20 minutes. You'll have to stay up a little bit later than you usually do, but that's it. Uh, but we can, we, 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 we can, we can uh, bring you in. I can bring people in from all over. I can assign an author um, and then have that author on. We, last week, uh, you know, I had students watch a Saudi uh, a film, and then we had the lead actor, or leading Saudi comedian, um, um, uh, uh, come in last week. So I'm, I'm aided that way. 
I'm aided also, I think, by the evolution of scholarship, right? When I began teaching 1987, if I was going to assign something in English, it was probably written by somebody in an American or maybe a European university. Um, if it was written by somebody from the region, they were probably trained and based and conceivably even based. That's not true anymore. Um, and there are, there's all kinds of scholarly production that's produced in English. Um, uh, you know, which is a necessary requirement for, for most, not all of my students, but for most of them, um, that I can draw. Um, and, um, you know, for all kinds of reasons, um, English is kind of an awkward, an academic lingua franca, which means that there's just an awful lot more material that I can draw on, even media material. Um, uh, there's an awful lot more literature that's translated and so on. So there's just an awful lot more. Um, I'm aided by a couple other things as well. I think one is um, um, a long career. I've been here a long time, but I've been studying the Middle East a long time. So there are people that I can draw on, networks that I, that, that I can draw on. Um, and I'm aided actually by students in two critical ways. I'm aided by the students in the class. Um, and I'll engage, I'll, I'll give a, a, a sort of gross generalization here. The students that I teach at GW now, I think, tend to be, and these are tendencies, um, empathy is a lot more of a value than it was when I started teaching, and um, understanding various points of views comes more naturally, I think. So, so I walk into a classroom and students are going to be pressing me. Um, um, uh, you know, I remember being pressed a few years ago, and this, uh, this was great, I had assigned two basic introductory works on Islam, and the student said, why are you assigning a work by this person who's not a Muslim. Why don't you assign more works by this person um, who is a Muslim? And the interesting thing is she got them reversed, who was a Muslim and who wasn't. But I'm going to be pressed on questions like that. Um, and and the, I'm also aided by our, our grad students. Ingrid um, had talked about herself as a political theorist. She's also director of our uh, doctoral program in political science. Um, and that turns out to be a real resource, right? So I've got a TA from the course who's from Saudi Arabia, um, and he's very well connected in all kinds of intellectual circles. So I can say to him, hey, Sultan, you know, we need somebody who can do this. Um, um, I've got a student right now who's working on... Uh, uh, a student, he's, he's, he's from Palestine, but he's done his higher ed here, and he's doing his dissertation now on LGBT movements in the Middle East. Um, so I see Hannah, who's in my class, we're going to be hearing from him in a, in, 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 in a couple of weeks. So, so students are a real resource. Uh, again, when I said when I, when I walked in here in 1987, um, students with experience in the region were people to resist. Um, it's putting it a little bit too strongly, maybe a little bit unfair to myself, but not completely. Um, and now they're a resource to draw, both the undergraduates who are in the class where they press me, and as a resource uh, really for connections to debates, cultural forums, um, and um, speakers and readings in, in, in the region that I wouldn't necessarily be aware of or have full access to. Okay, great. Thank you, um, Professor Brown. Um, with that, I, I would like to turn uh, to the students to each brief, briefly give uh, their perspective. And let me introduce them first, and then um, and then I'll turn to them. So the three Elliott School students I have here are Lauren Hewa, who is also the student co-chair of the Curriculum Working Group on the Diversity Council. So thank you for your work on that, Lauren. And um, so she's helped a lot. And then TJ Boland, who is also a student representative on the Diversity Council and uh, Hannah Jackson, who is the founder, <laughs> a real entrepreneur of the Young Black Professionals in International Affairs, and we've been working closely together as well. So um, with that, I'd like to first hear a, a couple of words from uh, Lauren, please. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here today. My name is Pamela Lauren Hua. Sometimes you hear me referred to as Lauren or Pamela. I go by both. I am a second year student at the Elliott School. I began my time at GW back in 2019. Um, and I also started being a student representative that same semester on the Council for Diversity and Inclusion. Uh, throughout my time at GW, I have, I, I've really, I've really loved it. Um, I, I grew up in a very, um, I grew up in, in Southern states like Texas, Florida, that were very um, more narrow-minded in terms of the communities that I was in. And so when I decided that I, you know, when I was choosing what I wanted to study, I wanted to pick something I knew nothing about. 
And I think that that concerned my parents a little bit because they were thinking, oh my goodness, we're about to send her off to school and she's gonna pick something and she might hate it. Um, I, I've really fallen in love with international affairs um, and, and I'll share just a little bit of um, some of the importance of inclusive syllabi. Uh, my first uh, course session, I, I don't remember, I think it was probably early August, 2019. I walked into a big lecture hall, there were probably 150 students. Um, and this was before the professor started teaching. I don't believe he'd walked in yet. Um, and I was talking with students and we were just, you know, introducing ourselves and going over the syllabi that we've been sent. And there was conversation um, about how the syllabi wasn't very inclusive. And so very early on my time at GW, that was, that was something that was evident to me and some of my peers. And that's why I um, eventually ended up working with Dr. Dr. Lal on the, uh, on the curriculum and development working group. So my, my time here at GW has, has been wonderful, um, but the importance of inclusive syllabi has, has been very evident. Um, GW's, GW's goal in creating world leaders um, has always been at the forefront of syllabi and has always been at the forefront of um, professors teachings, rightfully so. Um, but, but the inclusive teachings also propel these student leaders to be cognizant of social movements and biases that impact modern political uh, policy. And so it, it's, it's wonderful to have the opportunity to work with Dr. Law and uh, uh, TJ Boland and Hannah Jackson um, and some other Elliott community members on um, just working on this goal and bringing it to fruition. So thank you guys. Great, thanks, Lauren. Um, now uh, I'll move to Hannah uh, next. Thank you. Um, I, I'd first like to thank both Professor Brown and, and Professor Grappel for their remarks um, on the steps they've taken to actively make their, their syllabi more inclusive. Similar to a few points Lauren made, you know, as a freshman, I, I recognized maybe within maybe a few months that just the lack of diversity student-wise, but also curricula-wise within the Elliott School. And, and that is what really propelled me to, to start Young Black Professionals in, inter in International Affairs um, as a freshman. But from the perspective of a student in the Elliott School, a diverse syllabi is, I think, paramount, sorry, because so much of the pedagogical, pedagogical models um, within the field of international affairs are rooted in I think Eurocentric, Eurocentric ideologies um, that I think perpetuate a bit of American exceptionalism. And this is something that Professor Brown touched on briefly, um, as well as the, the othering of, of non-Western nations, cultures and, and systems of governance that I think deters a real understanding of, of the societies and, and systems that are different from our own. Um, and, and so as a student, the acknowledgement and the intentional inclusion of diverse perspectives, whether that's inviting diverse guest speakers uh, to lecture or to class or including the research and journalism of diverse scholars, it is so important to not only um, disrupting some of the prejudice that is historically characterized the discipline, but also preparing, you know, similar to what Lauren mentioned, you know, a generation of future international first practitioners to acknowledge um, understand and recognize the biases and, and, and quite frankly, the, the intersectionality of diversity in regards to race, gender, um, nationality, um, when creating policy abroad. Um, and, and to speak to Professor Brown's course, because I actually took his course um, on comparative politics um, of the Middle East, and, and I'm currently in his course on international affairs in the Middle East, Middle East as well. Um, I think I was so intrigued by you know, outside of the topic of the class, how diverse the readings for his course were. Um, and the intentional centering of, of Middle Eastern perspectives by um, inviting scholars, activists, writers, and, and lawyers from the region to class. Um, so it was refreshing to learn um, about a region of the world that is conventionally framed as, as one that is beset with conflict, terrorism, political upheaval, upheaval um, a narrative that I, I thought of as mostly true before taking the class, but instead of teaching a region that is so complex politically, economically, and socially through in, in 
Orientalist lens, vastly different from our own. Uh, Professor Brown, uh, I think, challenged us to think about what has been conceived as perhaps old age concepts of identity in the region as, as ones that have, have really been politicized over the past couple of decades. And, and, and he approaches his teaching in a way that examines regions usually seen as alien, similar to Africa or Latin America, for example, within the food of IA, through a non Eurocentrist lens that serves to, I think, enrich understanding rather than obscure it. Thank you so much, Hannah. And I'm so glad that you were in Professor Brown's class. Um, nice insider <laughs> knowledge there. So and I'd like to move on to TJ. Um, hi, everybody. I'm TJ. Um, I'm a sophomore here at the Elliott School, um, concentrating in econ. I don't really know if that's relevant. Also, I'd like to apologize in advance if there are any weird noises that come from my computer. My dorm room is across from the newly under construction Thurston Hall. Um, so we could get some weird sounds, but it's all part of the journey. Anyway, um, I know for me personally, I definitely walk through this world as a white man, um, even as a member of the LGBTQ plus community, that isn't necessarily something that you can see from an exterior. Um, and I know that my experience growing up in downtown Chicago and attending public schools in Chicago they very much instilled in all of us the importance of diversity and different perspectives inside of classes, um, not just on like an international sphere, but just in like terms of our, our community um, in the Chicagoland area is very much like one that is super, super diverse um, and really acts as kind of a microcosm of the way that the world kind of works. Um, and I know that getting onto GW's campus and starting to survey a lot of the courses inside of the Elliott School, the ones that for me have been the most engaging and the ones that I've actually taken the most from are also the ones that aren't necessarily viewing things from the white man lens that I already have. They're the ones that are incorporating these perspectives from people that are actually on the ground. They're the ones that are incorporating all sorts of different lenses to help you kind of get a more well-rounded view of what exactly the topic that you're surveying is. Um, and kind of like from what Hannah said, I can tell that Professor Brown is doing a great job of that. Um, commend you on that. Um, but I, I lost my train of thought. With that, yeah. Um, okay, all right. Thank you, TJ. <laughs> I appreciate it. And I'm going to um, hog the mic for a minute and ask a question each first before I open the floor to, to Q&A. Um, I wanted to ask uh, first, uh, Professor Krapel, um, what I wanted to know is um, if someone is teaching a course, as you alluded to in your, your comments, someone is teaching a course that is considered standard theories of whatever, political science theories of international relations, um, and so forth, how would you suggest that they start on the path to diversifying their course and, and, and being in inclusive of different ideas? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, that, that was the question that I um, had posed to myself because I feel a little bit like it's cheating for me to, for 20th century political thought, there are already lots of things to include, but say if you're if you're teaching medieval political thought or ancient political thought it seems less obvious to include classic texts that would satisfy the requirement of diversity but i think the way that you can do that is through um thinking about the themes say aristotle writing about slavery that's a huge issue, right? That is a massive uh, phenomenon in the world and in history and in human history. So looking at his argument and how he developed it and how it's different from the ways in which the institution of slavery changed over time and then what we fought about and then how the language of enslavement is so powerful in Western political thought that allows you to open up um, a, a perspectives of diversity um, in, in such a way that 
you can be teaching the classics so the students learn Plato and Aristotle and whatever, but they see the relevance of, of their writing. Um, how it, in a, That's perhaps a negative way, but also you, you talk about the positive way in which they can do that. Um, so I, I, just to give an example of my own coming to terms with this, I taught a course uh, called Fundamental Categories of Political Thought, the state rights in the public sphere. And so I used, I organized it on the basis of who, who articulated the fundamental ideas of the state first, and then how, what was the lineage of thinking that changed over time in relation to that fundamental thinker and uh, the, the debates about the state or rights or the public sphere. And I noticed when I taught the course, um, it was a lot of dead white men, right? And, um, and my students were just really pissed off. Um, and so they really pushed back at me. And um, it just really helped me think differently about how I was teaching. Um, and so just to, to kind of like defend why some of those classes seem really stilted, it's partially because when you are becoming a professional and getting your PhD in an academic field, there have been certain norms about what it means to have conquered your academic field and typically what is required of uh, mastering that field is a pretty standard set of, of questions and texts. And so I think what we are going through now is a is actually we are broadening what are considered the necessary standard texts. And so you're going to see changes over time in the academy. Um, so we're kind of right, I think, at the forefront of having to do that. Because if you just teach these things in a typical way, the students are not absorbing it and responding to it and reacting to it within their own lives because they're just seeing it in this stilted kind of bunch of stuff you have to memorize, like you know, you're in medical school or something when in fact politics is very much about the world and how it works. And so it's necessary that the world and how it works, it's not just dissecting a butterfly or a cadaver, it's a world that keeps moving and is self-interpreting. It's a hermeneutic world. And so we, as professionals who are, are you know, kind of describing an academic field, we are going to have to deal with that fact about our world. So I, th I think that, um, that is a rationale for everyone, even if you're teaching international security, which seems very kind of boring and how could you include diversity in that, right? Or theories of comparative politics. It's necessary to start introducing some kind of bandwidth for, for inclusivity and, and diversity within the field of international security, for instance, which seems the most recalcitrant kind of field to, to being open to that. So. Um, I guess I just think that you you need to think about uh, what the students perceive as what is security, you know, or you broaden it in terms of themes, thinkers, issues, and what is relevant and and where's a source of power in the world today, and how do we think about that? So that's the way I I would suggest people try to broaden their their syllabi or their their teaching. Great, thank you. And and by the way, I agree with you on uh, international security very much. Uh, I I am in the security studies program, and uh, I spend a lot of time uh, trying to uh, flip <laughs> the, the context of what is standard in the field. Uh, so I agree with you. It does take some thinking, but it's it's all there, absolutely. Um, and now I'd like to uh, turn to uh, Professor Brown and ask you. Um, and again, you you alluded to this in your comments. But often I find that foreign policies towards the Middle East are considered from the national interest of the United States. How should students and professors approach the issue of perspective and national interest when looking at things like regional studies? Um, it's a great question. Um, and um, um, in a sense, 
um, I've got an assignment that's designed to basically to do this. And I've structured the course in, in order to, 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 to approach this. So when we think about the Middle East in an American context, we usually think of it in terms of, I mean, Hannah was just saying, it's a place of conflict, but a place of specific policy challenges. Like, what, what are we going to do with the Iranian nuclear program? What are we going to do with, you know, Mohammed bin Salman? What does it mean for the United States and so on? And those are fine questions. I mean, we're at a school of international affairs. We're training international affairs professionals. We're training people who will be called upon to answer questions like that, to think about them. Um, but I don't want to start there. Um, and so the course that, 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 uh, 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 that, that I'm teaching right now essentially starts a little bit more in the region. What are the issues and how are they seen from the perspective of various parties there? And the final assignment actually, is I have students compare, take an issue and compare media coverage in one Middle Eastern society versus a, a, a media coverage in the United States. So how does it, how does this issue, you know, not necessarily what should be done, but just what is the issue? How is it understood as an issue? Um, um, so, so, you know, I was uh, talking to a student today um, who's working on the paper and, and she's working on issues of, um, sexual harassment in Egypt. And she said, I found a lot of the stuff in the American press. And a lot of it was about either connecting it to, um, um, okay, this is, you know, we had our Me Too movement, this is their Me Too Too movement, you know? And, and so we understand it in, 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 in our terms, or it's tied to other kinds of issues. Like it was the Egyptian uprising of 2011, which got an awful lot of attention. Okay, we understand in connection with something else that the United States cares about. Um, that um, 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 uh, that uh, that's how we understand it. Or the, the the final couple of weeks of the course, what I'm going to try to be doing is taking some policy issues and saying, okay, this is how it appears by people who are actually deeply affected in living this issue, and this is how it appears as a foreign policy problem in 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 the United States. So I'm not trying to teach them not to ask policy questions, uh, but to realize when they're doing so, they are asking a policy question that the that that there are Israelis and Palestinians, for instance, who are more than simply a problem for American uh, policymakers to deal with. Great, thank you. Um, that is actually excellent. I like it. Look at it from everyone's perspective. And, um, and now I'm gonna go to the Q&A. Um, we've got one question waiting here from Daphna. Uh, and she says that um, she's loving the conversation about inclusive syllabi and thinking deeply about how to bring voice in the classroom. Um, and she's wondering if you could say more about the inclusive classroom facilitation or assessment techniques as well. In other words, what strategies for thinking in addition to or beyond the syllabus, have you found most resonant as a student or professor, especially when you're doing the work of disrupting prejudice, Eurocentrism, et cetera? Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll throw that to um, either uh, Nathan or Ingrid, whoever would like to take that first. Oh, I, I let's see. I guess I, I, um, I have felt that, I, I don't know if, if the students at GW are just particularly um, respectful of one another, or if it's the fact that, you know, the class is structured just to be pretty honest and straightforward. Um, I remember when I first started teaching Beauvoir and had to talk about sex and stuff like that, I, I felt terrified. And, you know, it just felt like, how can I talk about that in front of 50 undergrads? Um, but then you just kind of have to get used to it and you do it. And so, it, it, you know, trying to be respectful, but also honest in some way breaks the ice, perhaps. Um, so just trying to model respectfulness and be open to other people's views and that this is a requirement in the class. Um, I don't know, it's just difficult. It's something you just try to, you know, e experiment with, I guess. Um. <laughs> I would, I, if I can come in, I would answer partly like uh, Ingrid just did. Um, um, GW students make it easy, right? <laughs> because the atmosphere on campus is just very, very supportive. 
but there's something else that I do. I mean, we talked about modeling. Um, I do. A, I try to do a little bit of that. Obviously, treating people with respect. I I I hope, but also um, I do try to. I, I tried this experiment, and I don't know how well it worked. Um, but so I, I tape mini lectures before the class session. I say, okay, watch this. This is a basic introduction to the topic. Um, and in there, I talk about some issues that, you know, how to speak up in class if you're shy. Um, um, because I'm painfully shy. That's one reason I love Zoom, because I can, you know, uh, puts a barrier between me and other people. It's, it, it, uh, um, so, so, so things like that. Or even how to ask for a letter of recommendation, right? If you're a student who is coming from a background where you're not kind of on this track, where you're kind of told and expected what to do, there are basic questions like that. When do you go to office hours? How do you use office hours? Um, um, and, 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 and things like this. How's your professor going to react to you if you come in with this kind of question or that kind of question? That's what I tried to do. I don't know how what, what will Zoom will end, right? And we'll be back in person. And I'm thinking now, is there anything in there that I can do that would be that that, that would be worth keeping in making that transition back? back? Or oh, the other thing, by the way, that I can do is because there are different kinds of, of, of learning and speaking styles, do a lot of small breakout sessions. And then you know pull them all back because there are students who just and they've told me they feel much more comfortable in front of three or four of their fellow students rather than raising their hand and speaking in front of 50 or 60 people um and i don't know how to do that in person um so so i think that might be a question i would like bounce back even to our students I and mean, what is it that you've seen that's worked and what is it that 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 is well-intentioned but may not work students <laughs> I can speak to this for just a minute. Um, I believe that uh, what Dr. Brown was saying, what does work, um, be having um, certain speakers coming in to the course, uh, especially with online, I have found that a lot of my professors have taken that opportunity to um, increase um, not only the the guest speakers, but but the the diverse backgrounds of the of the guest speakers. Um, for example, I am in an IAF thirty one eighty six course right now, and for all of my sessions, it's a um, we meet once a week. So for all of my sessions, we have a guest speaker who comes in for the first hour, and then the second hour and a half is with our professor. Um, and I think that a, a model like that has really helped. Um, has really helped not only engage students because Elliott students, we love our professors, but it's all, it's nice to hear from other people too. It's a nice variety. Um, so it's really helped not only engage students, um, but in terms of things that, that haven't worked, um, I, I still think that there's, for example, I was going through, um, on, on Blackboard for students, there's an opportunity, well, there, there was, I don't know if it's still up, where you could look at previous syllabi before your course registration. And you could kind of use that as a guide to decide which courses you were going to take for your next semester. Um, and so I was using that to try to figure out what courses I was going to take for um, fall 2022. Wow, it's hard to believe. Um, <laughs> That's really hard to believe, yeah. Um, so I was looking at courses for fall 2022 and I was going through some of the syllabi and and through some of them lack diversity. Um, and it and in terms of, I mean, I, I remember I looked at one syllabi and there was only one scholarship written by a woman um, and, and no scholarship written by um, anyone who identified as another gender. So, that to me, considering that you know GW is not only responsible for creating its leaders and, and propelling them for um, the real world, there's also a certain level of responsibility given the notoriety of our program to uh, continue trying to uh, increase the inclusion and the intentional inclusion and diverse perspectives of uh, various community members for international affairs. Great, thanks Lauren. And uh, any other students, uh, either Hannah or TJ, want to jump in with any comments on what works? Or I would just echo everything Lauren just said. Um, I actually had a question um, <laughs> for Professor Brown. Okay, and, and Professor Capel as well. Um, and it is 
for professors who maintain that, and I guess right, rightfully so perhaps, that they have the rights to their syllabi and what it contains and, and subsequently refrain from diversifying their syllabi, do you all think that it will take incentivizing professors to do so in order for us to see substantial changes in the Elliott curricula? And, and if so, how can we incentivize them? Because the, the sad reality, um, Professor Krufel and Professor Brown, is that you all are an anomalies, um, quite frankly, um, and professors are quite hesitant to revise their syllabi or even include a diversity statement at the end of their syllabus, um, which is something I also um, noticed that Professor Brown um, included um, even before I took his course, but yeah. <laughs> I'll try, and then maybe you can continue. It is hard, right? Um, um, you know, as faculty members, what we're told, you're, you know, you're here because of your expertise, and kind of the classroom is your space, um, and nobody can tell you what to teach. Um, and there are certainly fields where you're expected to teach in a specific way, right? If you take microeconomics at GW and you take it at somewhere else, it's going to look the same. But the subjects that Ingrid and I are teaching, the, they are going to be very different from place to place. So, so, so it's going to be hard for that reason. Um, one thing I will say is time will help. It really will help. Um, um, I mentioned how, if I were to have tried to do this, as I said, like when I first started teaching at GW, I wouldn't have been able to. Um, now, in, at least in my field, it would be very, very hard to avoid. I could make an effort, right, to, to do it, but it, it would actually, I'd almost have to exclude, exclude certain voices. Uh, that's partly because of the nature of the field. I'm doing, you know, Middle Eastern politics and, and Middle Eastern society, so, so it, it kind of lends itself um, um, uh, to diverse voices um, more easily than some other fields. Um, but I would say what you just said was, asking, that's good. That kind of prompted me a little bit. I heard from Ingrid that it prompted her a little bit. That, um, so, so ask gently, but persistently, even come up with suggestions. Um, the, um, the, the, actually the, one of the first changes I made, this is something that I assigned in, in class that you're taking with me, uh, Hannah, the Supreme Constitutional Court of Egypt decision. So a student came up to me, and this was like 25 years ago and said, you're assigning all this stuff about Muslims, but there's no Muslim voices. And I thought, okay, where, where, where am I going to assign a text? I had to sit down and translate this thing. Um, um, but it was in response to a student saying, I want to hear something directly from, uh, 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 from a source addressing these questions. Um, so I would say, you're, 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 I turn, asked a question to you and you bounced it back to a question for me and I'm bouncing it back to you. Ask your professors, ask politely but persistently. Ingrid, would you like to add something? I, I just want to second that um, because I think professors are very proprietary over their, their courses. They've invested a ton of work in putting together their courses. They don't want somebody coming in from the outside and saying, you need to do this. Uh, you know, freedom of thought, whatever. They, they feel like this is what the students need to learn or I won't be doing my job well. But if you, if you ask them and say, you're ignoring this and not just for diversity's sake, but because it's essential to understanding the world. It's not about tokenism, it's about understanding the world. And so ask them, push them. And uh, as Nathan said, gently, but, but um, it's important. Um, so I, I think that that's the best way to do it. But I also believe that eventually this is going to be come the case. Um, so as I said before, we're in the middle of that kind of kind of slow change. And so it feels harder when you're in the middle of change than you know when you kind of see it coming down the road. So um, right now. thank you. Now I know we have more questions on the panel and we don't have that much time, but I want to make sure I'm not missing something from the floor. Um, Kylie, am I not seeing um, more questions over there? Um, at the moment, I think that the queue is clear. If anyone wants to take this opportunity to submit additional questions, we do have a few more moments. Um, okay, great. Um, then I was going to first, uh, I'm going to actually ask um, one more question. Um, 
so I'm going to throw this one back to Ingrid, actually. Um, Ingrid, uh, you know, I actually find, uh, you know, it very interesting that you take uh, theories that many people, I think someone could have done your political thought syllabus and done it in a very different way, obviously. It could have been a political thought syllabus that did not include uh, women or people who are not white men. I think that could have very easily happened. So um, I just wanted to know when you were selecting the theories and readings to include, what were some of the criteria that you considered that some people may not be thinking about? Well, say if I, I'm teaching early modern politi political thought, um, there's not, it doesn't feel like a lot of diversity in that. There's only one woman, Mary Wollstonecraft. Um, some people wouldn't have even included her. Um, but uh, I think I would add more diversity in if I were to teach that again, which I probably will. But when I included Wollstonecraft, um, the criteria was she is of a stature she made, uh, she had a lot of influence in subsequent ways of thinking about women and rights. Um, so she was an original thinker who, who made a difference. Um, and uh, the theme of rights after the French Revolution, you know, universal rights of man, she goes, what about the rights of women, right? You have all this language about universal rights of man. What about women? It was just this huge kind of shock to people that she actually said that. Um, so that is that warrants her being absolutely included. That is essential for the way in which things started changing. You know, you have then John Stuart Mill, and you have others who started think about women in a different way. Um, so that's one way in which I included that. I think I would probably. I, I just was reading a wonderful essay in an op-ed in today's New York Times about the influence of um, a Muslim thinker on uh, Daniel Defoe and his, his novel, Robinson Crusoe. And it's just a fantastic little um, article about uh, the deep influence of Muslim thinkers on uh, early modern thought. So that would be a way in which you could include somebody in the, tradition, the, the traditional lineup of the history of political thought. Great, thank you. Uh, Again, just a few minutes left. Uh, so first, I'm going to run back to the students. Um, uh, Lauren or TJ or Hannah, do any of you have a question that you'd like to ask? Go ahead, Lauren. Did you just nod your head? Yes, I did. I'm sorry. I was waiting to see if somebody else wanted to speak first. Um, uh, first of all, thank you, Professor Capelli and Professor Brown for sharing your time with us today. Um, again, thank you for um, serving as a as a uh, a model for um, curriculum in this way, um, Dr. Brown. This might be more of a question for you, um, but uh, Dr. I'm sorry, Professor Capelli said that um, an inclusive uh, syllabi was somewhat going to become the standard within the next couple of years. Um, what are your thoughts on that, and how do you think as um, a community of scholars where that isn't our current reality, how do you think that we can support that, um, that, that notion? Um, yes, I think it is, it, is, it is going to become a reality. Um, it would become a reality without anybody asking for it, simply because of the way that scholarship is changing, at least in some fields. It may not be in all fields. Um, um, you can hear from Professor Lal about, about this, uh, security studies, but that's got a reputation for lagging a little bit behind. Justified or not, I don't know, but she's nodding. Um, and, and what I feel is we're probably a little bit ahead, not because anybody's necessarily more open-minded. That's just the way that the world, that scholarship is being produced. Um, 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 how to encourage that? I, I mean, one thing I will say is, um, is one thing that I've had to do is kind of relax my understanding of what I would say is boundaries. Somebody is an academic, a scholar, somebody is a journalist, somebody is an activist. Um, and so what you wind up doing sometimes, this might be just unique to my field, but what you wind up doing sometimes is the activist is a subject of study, right? The, 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 uh, the academic is somebody who, um, the academic is somebody who sits back and analyzes. And there's some truth to that, right? But, but there's an awful lot of academics in the Middle East right now who are 
politically quite active. There are a lot of activists who, who, who are very, very reflective of, of what's going on. So what I found, at least in my own material, is that I have to sort of think not simply what who am I assigning, but why am I assigning this person? Am I assigning this person as a subject of study, or am I assigning this person as an, as an expert on a subject matter or as for, for a different point of view and so on? And that's where I think we probably got to be not simply inclusive, but a little bit kind of deliberate in, in, in our thinking. Again, that might be just unique to my field um, of sort of comparative politics, um, um, but it's one thing that I'm finding myself having to do. Great. Thank you. And I think we're pretty much out of time here. So what I want to say is thank you so much, Professor Brown. Thank you, Professor Kropel, for your really insightful uh, comments today and also for just creating such beautiful courses that I know that the students are really appreciating as you heard here today as well. Um, and of course, thank you students, Lauren, TJ, Hannah, thank you for your insights. I know that they're really helpful and they're helping push us to be more excellent um, every day. So um, thanks everyone. Thanks for the attendees as well. Kylie. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, I saw a couple of final questions about resources. And so I'm um, just, I think that I'll, I'll be happy to share a follow-up email with all of our attendees today. If you all have recommendations for resources, um, strategies, approach. So thank you. Everyone take care.